Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about ionic bonding. Ionic bonds are formed between two ions. So let's first talk about what an ion is. Ions are formed when electrons are transferred in an attempt to become stable. So atoms that become positively charged ions give up their electrons in order to become stable and ions that or atoms that become negatively charged ions take on more electrons in order to become stable. And the point of stability that we are going to be discussing is eight valence electrons. So valence electrons are the electrons in the outermost energy level of an atom or an ion. Those are the ones that are involved in bonding. So when atoms form ions, their electrons are transferred from one outer energy level to another atom's outer energy level in order for the, both of those atoms to become ions and achieve stability. We call this the octet rule. The octet rule is when atoms have eight valence electrons. That's when they're the most stable and they look like the noble gases. And that's the goal. All atoms want to achieve this point of stability of the noble gases. So ionic bonds are formed between a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion. And generally this means the positively charged ion is a metal and the negatively charged ion is a non-metal. Now we have special names to discuss our different charged ions. We call positively charged ions cations and negatively charged ions anions. So ions come together to form a neutral compound and that means that the positive charge has to equal and cancel out the negative charge. So you can see here in the diagram we have sodium with its one valence electron giving up that one valence electron to chlorine which has seven valence electrons. Once sodium loses that one valence electron, its now outer energy level has eight, and it's at the point of stability. Chlorine takes on an additional electron, so its outer energy level also has eight and has also reached a point of stability. And when that happens, an ionic bond is formed. It forms from the transfer of electrons. So it's easy to predict the charge that these um, elements will form based on their location on the periodic table. So we're gonna take a look at the periodic table for a second. If you go to ptable.com and click on the electrons tab, you can see what the most common oxidation states are by looking at this top row here in gray. And the number that's listed in bold is the most common oxidation state for that element. An oxidation state is what we're going to refer to as a charge. So you can see all of the elements here in group one have the most common oxidation state of plus one. The elements in group two have a most common oxidation state of plus two. So these first two groups are part of what we call the main group elements. This section over here, these six groups are also considered main group elements. So we're gonna look at those two sections of the periodic table when we talk about predicting their charges. So like I said before, group one is plus one, group two is plus two. We're going to skip over here to group 13, which has elements that have the most common oxidation state of plus three. Group 14 could be plus four or minus four, depending on the element. Group 15 elements are going to most commonly form a charge of minus three. Group 16 generally forms minus two. Group 17 minus one, and then group 18 elements are neutral because they are stable on their own. Those are the noble gases that we were referring to. So we're gonna talk about three different types of ionic compounds today. The first is called binary ionic compounds. And these ionic compounds are formed between two elements, a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion, usually a metal and a non-metal. When we write formulas for binary ionic compounds, we use what's called the cross and drop method. And um, what we're gonna do when we use the cross and drop method is write the symbols of both ions next to each other with their charges written as superscripts. So up top, um, written at the top of the element symbol. Then we're gonna take the number from that charge, not the sign, just the number, and we're gonna do what's called cross and drop. We're gonna bring that number down next to the opposite element. And then we're gonna write those numbers as subscripts. And if possible, we're going to reduce or simplify them. 
Here are a few examples. So magnesium bromide, magnesium forms a plus two ion, bromine forms a minus one ion. And so we're gonna take the numbers two and one, and we're going to cross and drop them. We're gonna bring the two down next to the bromine, and the one is gonna come down next to magnesium. And the formula would be MgBr2. Here we have sodium chloride. Now both of these ions form a one. We have a plus one and we have a minus one. So they would cancel each other out and we would write the formula as NaCl. Here's a third example, aluminum oxide. We have aluminum, which forms a plus three ion. Oxygen forms a minus two ion. We're gonna take those numbers and bring them down to the opposite side to form our compound Al2O3. When we're writing the names for these compounds, we're always going to follow the same uh, method. We're going to first name the cation. Then we're going to take the root of the anion's name and change the ending to IDE. So for example, MgBr2, we have magnesium and bromine. That would become magnesium bromide. Here we have NaCl sodium chloride um, formed but between sodium and chlorine. So we change the ending of the chlorine to IDE. The second type of ionic compounds are those containing transition metals. Transition metals can have multiple different charges. So we have to designate which charge we are using or which charge is present by using a Roman numeral. And that's called the stock system. We use Roman numerals to indicate the charge on our transition metal. So here I have listed the first eight Roman numerals. You will not be responsible for anything larger than eight. When we're writing the formulas for these compounds, we're gonna use the same cross and drop method that we use with the binary ionic compounds. So the Roman numeral um, in the name is going to indicate the charge on the transition metal. And those metals are always going to be positively charged. So we're always going to know because it's a metal, it's gonna form a positive charge. So here's an example, copper, Roman numeral two, oxide. Copper is going to have a charge of plus two. We know that based on the Roman numeral two. That's the charge on copper. Oxygen is going to form a negative two ion because it always forms a negative two ion based on its location on the periodic table. We take those twos and we cross and drop them and we get the formula Cu2O2 which can then be simplified to CuO. Our second example here is cobalt three fluoride. That's how you would read that, cobalt Roman numeral three fluoride. So cobalt has a charge of plus three, and we know that because of the Roman numeral. And fluorine has a charge of minus one, and we know that based on its location on the periodic table. And we're gonna take those numbers and cross and drop them. We don't write the one, remember, just like in algebra, you don't write a one in front of the X, and we bring the three down next to the F, COF3. And when we're writing the names for these compounds that contain transition metals, we're gonna use the same method that we did with the binary ionic compounds. We're gonna name the cation first, and then we're going to place the Roman numeral in parentheses, and then we're gonna take the root of the anion and change the ending to IDE. So here are two examples to show you the difference between a transition metal that has two different charges. We have Fe2O3 and FeO. They're both iron oxide, but the difference is the Roman numeral. So Fe2O3 is iron with a Roman numeral three oxide, and FeO is iron with a Roman numeral two oxide. We get the Roman numeral based on the charge of our negative ion or our anion. So in the first example, oxygen has a charge of minus two. And we know there are three of those oxygen ions because of the formula. So if we multiply the charge by the number of ions, we have a total negative charge of six from our oxygen. And then we know iron has to cancel that out. So two irons have to equal positive six, which means one single iron ion would have a charge of plus three. The same is true for the next example, iron Roman numeral two oxide. Oxygen is always minus two. Here we have a one to one ratio. So iron has to be plus two.
The third type of ionic compounds are those containing polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are groups of covalently bonded atoms that contain an overall charge. And then this group of atoms bonds to an oppositely charged ion to form an ionic compound. So here are a list of some polyatomic ions that you will have um, provided for you on Google Classroom. Most of them are negatively charged. The charges are listed here next to them. So if it has a number and a sign, positive or negative, that's the charge. So that would be a minus two. These are all minus one. Um, here we have a minus three and a minus two and a minus one. And then we have one positively charged ion up here. When we write formulas, we're going to use that same cross and drop method that we use for the binary ionic compounds. Um, the only difference would be that if we are crossing and dropping a number greater than one to the side of the polyatomic ion, we have to remember to use parentheses around that polyatomic ion. So here are some examples. The compound sodium carbonate. Sodium has a charge of plus one based on its location on the periodic table. Carbonate is one of your polyatomic ions. It has a charge of minus two. The formula is CO3. So we take the one from sodium and the two from carbonate and we cross and drop them. Since we're bringing a one down next to our polyatomic ion, we don't have to worry about the parentheses. The two is coming down next to sodium, which is not a polyatomic ion, so we're not going to use parentheses there either. The formula is Na2CO3. Our next example here contains a polyatomic ion and a transition metal. So we have copper Roman numeral two, that tells us the charge is plus two. Sulfate, which has a charge of minus two. We're going to take our twos and cross and drop them. Now, if we were to leave this formula as it is, the SO4 would need to be placed in parentheses because we're crossing and dropping a number other than one. Um, but since both of our subscripts are two here, we're going to simplify or reduce them, and the formula would be CUSO4. Here we have another example, calcium hydroxide. Calcium has a charge of plus two. Hydroxide has a charge of minus one. Since we're bringing the two down next to hydroxide, we want to place hydroxide in parentheses this time. That tells us that we have two hydroxide groups, two oxygens and two hydrogens, not just one or the other. When we're writing the names for these compounds, we're going to use a similar method as we used with types one and two. We're going to name the cation first. If the um, first part of the compound is not a polyatomic ion, it'll most likely be a metal. So we'll name the metal, and then we will name the polyatomic ion. There's no changing of the endings here. Um, however, if we have a polyatomic ion first and an element second, then we would name the polyatomic ion just as it is, and then follow the same rules as before. We're going to take the root of the anion followed by an IDE ending. Uh, sometimes we will have two polyatomic ions bonded to one another ionically. And so then you would name the first poly polyatomic ion and then the second polyatomic ion, and you wouldn't change any of the endings. So here's an example. K is potassium. ClO4 is the polyatomic ion perchlorate. And mm. together they would form the compound potassium perchlorate. Here we have a polyatomic ion first and an element second. So NH4 is the polyatomic ion ammonium. F is the element fluorine. We'll change the ending of fluorine to IDE, and it becomes ammonium fluoride. All right, and that's it for our lesson on ionic bonding. I hope you guys learned a lot about ionic compounds. If you have any questions, please leave them in a comment below. Thanks for listening.